Live from the 97th floor of world famous World Play Inc. Studios, the one, the only, Hillary Scar. Hello! Hello! Welcome! I'm excited for the show. So, but first, give a roaring welcome to my co host, David Maldo. World famous world play inks studios. Oh. <laughs> that was me. Hello, <laughs> welcome. So happy you guys are here. I want to give a very warm welcome to our special guest today. We've got the one, the only John Savage, who is joining me here. <laughs> And our fabulous hello, hello, hello. and our fabulous interpreter Shirley Standiford from Portland. So if you're new to the show, I'm Hillary Scarl. This is my fabulous co-host, David Maldo, who is making all this incredible magic happen through the magic of his OBS green screen studio through uh, Let's Do Video, his fantastic production company. So David's actually in Florida and I'm in Los Angeles. John's in San Diego and Shirley's in Portland, but here we all are together making a little magic for all of you. <laughs> so I've been doing the show. We've been doing the show since January, 2021 as a way to hang with my incredibly talented friends. And it's my dog's squeaky toy. My apologies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my whole point of doing this is because I love creativity. I love artists and actors and photographers and realize that creativity is not linear, especially to me, a lot of people, they go off the beaten path, they try different things they have different artistry and I don't think anyone represents that better than John who's here today. So John, I have been following you for so many years. We've been friends now probably 20 something years and I have watched you do everything from art galleries to videos, your social media. You are always doing something different and surprising me. What age did you start to as an artist? Oh, yeah. Well, I think I was born like that. My parents, you know, are both hearing. And so they were always trying to give me something that I would enjoy, something that we could all have in common with, you know, the deaf parent, the hearing parents with the deaf child. So they were pretty creative in finding something that we could all do together. And art was the interest. They gave me, you know, paper and pen in the beginning. And I dove right in and everything came from that. Um, I think it just became a really healthy addiction, honestly. I have to agree. At, uh, I think art is extremely healthy and kids don't do it enough. And for adults, I mean, how great is it? How many times have you worked through things or ideas or frustrations through your art? Right, all right, I completely agree. And right now, I'm finally understanding the concept better too. The concept when they say to download, it doesn't necessarily mean a computer to another computer. It's more likely could be my brain to something else. That is a download. I agree, our brain. We get input all day long from so many sources and to have that kind of get mixed up in your brain and come out, I now, your art is making more sense to me now that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah well thank you to whoever invented the computer <laughs> thumbs up <laughs> exactly all right i'm going to read a little bit of your bio for people who do not know you uh so john grew up with a dad who was a photographer and a videographer and his mom was a hairstylist and she was an artist as well so i see where you probably had a lot of that in your family growing up. And John fell in love with media and visual arts, including photography, 
video editing, cinematography, acting, and painting. Throughout his childhood, he was passionately devoted to educating deaf people about the linguistic, social, political, and cultural issues of the deaf community. Late in 2011, he began creating contemporary art paintings based on people and classical subjects that inspired him by using abstract, bright colors, and clean cut painting style. John currently uses his paintings and photographs as life stories that reflect his visual journey. Did I get all that right, John? Yes, you did. Perfect. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you know me too much. <laughs> well, I would say there's, I just, the surface, because as we were even talking before the show, you you were telling me things that I did not know you do, which we're going to get to later in some of the discussions. But uh, I want to move us to the gallery to be able to start showing off some of your fabulous work as we chat further. So David, let's go ahead and give John his uh, gallery screening exhibit. <laughs> I love this. And when we were setting this all up on uh, during our tech, you mentioned that actually you have had exhibits, correct? Yes, I have. Actually, my experience really, um, it's been pretty nice. I kind of just jumped in and learned what everybody does, how that business part of it runs and all those different aspects of it. And so I thought, okay, why not? I'm just gonna jump right in and host my own uh, show. And so I advertised that for, for deaf artists to bring their work. And I wanted it to be in a public arena, somewhere that people would go on a regular basis. You know, you know there's art galleries that will take over that we could take over and it was deaf owned for the entire month and it was a wonderful experience. I mean, that is one of the great things about visual arts is that when you look at a painting, you don't necessarily know, oh, this was done by a hearing artist or a deaf artist. Do you agree? Right, right. Well, you know, there's a strong representation sometimes if the art has its own story. So if not only for successful artists, but when there's two people that are looking at the same piece of art, there it could become controversial in regards to that artwork. So the artwork itself means that it had a lot of value to it. And I love it's your work, a lot of deaf artists where you do have the deaf perspective that's put into your work. And that's something I always admired from Chuck Baird, B-A-I-R-D, like that he would do ASL hand shapes. And a lot of your artistic videos, you have ASL poetry, and that is unique, I believe, to deaf artists. And we do need more of that. How is that usually received from hearing audience members when they see that? all kinds of different reactions to that. And I, the thing is, I wanna, I wanna go back to Chuck Baird a little bit if I could. Uh, way back in 1992, I joined a hearing production, uh, a hearing group with artists and writers and actors. And there was no understanding really of deaf culture at that time. And I gave up, I was actually ready to leave until the doctor, uh, the director wrote me a note and said, you know, please, please, we, you know, we save this. We don't, we, we want to have the deaf actor in this play. And they were trying to convince me. And I ended up meeting Chuck Baird and they were saying that he did acting as well. But I'm like, wait, I thought he was an artist. And they said, no, he's actually an actor and a painter. And so I talked with him and we went back and forth a little bit. And I realized that, uh, you know, he, he kicked ass with this as a director and he came over to the director and showed him everything. And this is how I learned about my identity 
through acting. And then when I was, you know, playing with my ASL, I was just kind of having fun with it. Chuck Baird says to me, you know what that's called? That's ASL poetry you're doing right there. And I was like, oh, oh, well, I was in shock there, you know? And I thought, wow, well, that's mine. I own that. That's my own identity. That's who I am. So now from 1992 until today, I'm just going along with it and still processing through that. And I enjoy it immensely. I think that our founders and deaf history is so incredibly important. I remember the first time I met Chuck was in the, uh, 1995 when I was on tour with the National Theater of the Deaf. And the cast just rallied around him. He came to one of the shows and they're like, do you know who that is? That's Chuck. And he used to, I think he used to be an NTD actor. And he was just so gracious and generous. And then later uh, he had his art exhibition and I realized that you're right, he's a talented, very, he was a very talented painter and actor and just what a great human he was. So I feel like that he really gave us this foundation. I had never seen it before. I'm sure maybe there were others before him that he would have said influenced him. But yeah, talking about then poetry, like the first deaf poet I ever saw was Peter Cook. And like, that was the first time I had ever seen ASL played with in that way. And it blew my mind. So those were my very first exposures to ASL arts or deaf artists. Who were some of your influences? Did you have anybody that you looked up to or you feel inspired by either deaf or hearing? Oh, no. I'm trying to remember the name. It's, it's, um, um, I know, I know Val? you're talking about it's, yeah, no, it's, Excuse um, me for, it's someone in the chat, please help the, us. The, the, yes. yes, yes, that's the name sign. So anyway, so when they had a VHS back in the day, you know, and they were selling them um, through Don Sign Press. Mm -hmm. So I saw that VHS and I would watch that over and over and over again to that videotape wore out. And then I ended up working there at Don Sign Press and I can get it on DVD and rewatch it and rewatch it and rewatch it. <laughs> I know who you're talking about also. He was an older gentleman. Uh, yes. Just an incredible linguist. His, his language was just so inspirational. What about your visual art? Are there any, like, did you go to museums when you were a kid or galleries and see other artists that inspired you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, museums and stuff and art, I, I would see those and stuff, but the one that had the biggest impact on me was MTV actually, <laughs> you know? I, you know, I didn't care about the music per se, you know, and I was very focused on the editing of the videos and everything because my dad, you know, he was a professional uh, photographer and I understood the basics of it, you know, with focusing and exposure and the lighting and the, de the, depth of the depth perception and everything with that. And then to see things on MTV, it felt like everything broke the rules there and everything was random and the colors were all vibrant. And my dad was like, whoa, you know? And I was like, dad, tell me how to do this. And my dad was kind of, mm, I don't know, and trying to get some ideas and, okay, well, let's get two VCRs and maybe set them up and connect them and we'll have one TV and one would one camcorder and the one would record and the other would play and we would go back and forth with that and i felt like a vj you know like playing back and forth between the two v vhs players and then i would have them go forward and backwards and stuff and my dad would be like that's what they're doing and so it looked like too much work <laughs> so i was like yes but if you're interested and motivated and I was like, yeah, I am. But at the same time, it's too much work. And that was 19, what, 83, 84. And I kind of left it at that point, but I saw that process and it, it was, I had that flame start inside of me and it started to grow and burn. And until 2005, 
they came out with the digital era and so you know digital cameras were coming out all these technical cameras where you can switch to video mode and i was like wait a minute say that again so you could just switch and turn on a video and my my pc can plug into it oh my gosh that blew me away <laughs> so and i could see what i'm doing in editing and i can cut this and take it right out and put something else in there and and then youtube came out and I was like, oh, wow, okay, I can have my own MTV. I'm gonna call my myself JTV, okay. right on. <laughs> I love that. Uh, we're gonna show, David, can we pull up some of John's videos? I wanna show, because now that you said MTV is highly influential, I'm like, duh, of course, because I can see those uh, MTV styles in your work. All right. Is this the wrong one? Oh, I like this one. Now yeah, let's show this one and then we'll show the next one. Okay. I love right on. The, the vibrant colors. And, and is this done on acrylic? What are, or on wood? What, what is the canvas that you use? It's, it's spray paint. Uh, a lot of spray paint. I feel like, you know, 1980s, you know, it's got that 80s vibe where um, I'm not doing graffiti or anything like that, but it's got that kind of feel. And my dad actually used to work with spray painting cars at a car company. And so I learned a lot about that and their process for doing spray painting on that and got into that. And then I did some experimenting on my own and became really drawn to it and with the digital artwork because you know I'm already into that with the photography Photoshop and everything and I've been doing Photoshop since the 90s when a friend of mine in college gave it away for free we had a beta version of it and so I was just curious about it and I you know looked at it and I'm like what I could do this I can crop things out I can move things around and I can use different pictures and art and overlap everything Oh, wow, the ideas of doing film, photo and everything. I mean, it was just so many things. I drove, dove right into that and I'm still learning and going through with that. Uh, that's what I love. I think that that is the important thing for artists is to keep focusing and growing and changing. David, I think there's one more video. There's a moving one to see some of his MTV styled, but I saw like some of the ASL ones, the L-O-V-E. So is, is this your garage where you're doing your spray paint? Shh. <laughs> yeah, well, don't tell anyone that I'm doing it in the garage. Wink, wink. <laughs> we have to get you a gallery. We have to get you a professional studio space. You deserve that for sure. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. All the spray paint where it's a transition. Well, actually, I do it in the garage, actually, just like um, many famous develop, you know, people that are starting you know, everybody starts in the garage. So I'm doing the same thing. And we get all the all the famous ones start out in the garage. I think that's the best thing because you're not beholden to paying rent, you know, for some ridiculously high priced studio. So it gives you still flexibility to be true to your art. I think once you start getting into the commercial space, I don't think you have as much flexibility to stay true to yourself because you have to pay your rent. So my opinion is people who do work out of their home base and they get a little bit more creative freedom. And you said you, you do a lot of commissions, right? You have a lot of commission-based work. Oh, right. Yes, I do. Also, like if I'm going to rent another space, then I'm going to end up... Uh, in a hamster wheel doing that. So I'm, I'm going to feel like I'm, that's all I got to do and I'll lose the quality. I totally agree. I totally agree. Yes. And going back to the commission art. Yeah. It's interesting actually how that kind of came, came about. Uh, but I enjoy it a lot. You know, like when I was doing my original artwork, like what you see here in the gallery, 
And that process, I would have a few friends that would come and say, hey, I want to commission some work. I want to do what you're already doing. I want to add something to that. And I thought, wow, that's a lot more fun to do it with the customers, you know? So my original artwork is already there. And then to use the customer's influence on the top of that, it came, it came together and was a win-win for both of us. I think that's so creative. Those collaborations... They've, I can see how you would get inspired by that. So do you do mostly portraits or do people give you pictures of their dogs or requests for something abstract? What are your typical commissions like? Oh, actually I could do any of that. Um, I think it just so happens that a lot of it is portraits. Uh, when the first one, you know, came, other people saw that one and then wanted to do the same thing. So it was like a domino effect. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do that. And then all of a sudden there'd be somebody that said, hey, hey, can you do a flower? I want to commission some work to do a flower that matched their furniture, their, their design. And I was like, yeah, I could do that. And you know, I, I realized that when I put it up there with the colors and everything matched their, their design in their home. And I'm like, great, you got good taste. <laughs> I want to commission. Hillary, did, did we have it in the movie theater? No. Did we set, didn't we set it we up there? Should, should the I movie. take a quick peek? You want, yeah, well, let's, we're going to go to the movie theater, everyone, and see if we can't find John's video. If not, we'll come and right back here. If not, we'll come right back. So there won't be any um, spoken dialogues. We won't have our interpreters. So we'll just show it. It's all visual. And if it's not there, we will come back. You came to the wrong house, pig. Oops, this is Hillary. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. That was last week's guest. <laughs> was Hillary oh, Gerber, who is a horror actress. <laughs> maybe you can do a commission of her screaming. I think I think there was maybe that's a happy mistake. She's so good. <laughs> yeah, with a happy ending. With a happy ending, yes, where she doesn't get stabbed to death, but she turns into a surfboard or something, or she starts surfing. All right, speaking of we surfing, play with that. yeah, we've got a special uh, treat uh, because we're going to talk about your surfing because uh, you started surfing at how old? How old were you? I was probably 12. Yeah, so I was right around there. And there's... And actually, like, my inspiration for that was my dad. My dad was a surfer back in 1960s you know, when the whole sur surf boom went, took off in Southern California and it was everywhere. And um, was it Surfing USA? You yeah. know, that song and everything. So yeah. that's my dad's era. That's his time, you know? So he, that influenced me. He got me into surfing and now I have my kids are surfing. So uh, we're surfing and uh, without surfing, it's, it's, you know, we lose Southern California. Surfing and Southern California go hand in hand. That's very true. Speaking of which, happy early Father's Day, John. We're coming up this Sunday on Father's Day, so. Thank you. All right, so surfing. Do you, do you get out and surf a lot? I know people who are into surfing life can surf every day, every weekend. Is that you? Yeah, uh, well, before kids, you know, it would be like once or twice a week that I wouldn't surf. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's once or twice a week that I do surf. Got it. <laughs> After I had kids. <laughs> well, we are going to take you, because uh, I know you don't get to surf every day now, now that I know that. Uh, but we're going to surf to a special place because here on Hanging with Hillary, we really try to spread some happiness by bringing all our guests to our happy place through the magic of David. So if you had to pick your favorite place on earth, where would it be, John? Hmm, let me see, let me see. 
I, everybody wants to know if I want to tell you where I'm going to go to. It would be Malaga, Spain. Woo! Okay, David, let's take us through the magic of surfing. <laughs> oh, here goes the wave. Whoa. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And we landed. That's amazing. Wow, you didn't even get wet. That's that's some sheer talent. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. And you brought your interpreter surfing. That's very uh, accessible for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got their hair still dry too, right on. <laughs> I love that. So Malaga, Spain, tell me, why is this your happy place? Have you vacationed here? Yes, I have. I have to tell you, my, my special like moment that's still in my heart because of this. So when I envisioned everything, I thought, you know what, let's just go to Spain. And how I picked this particular city is because of my grandmother. Before she got married, her last name was Menya, M-E-N-A, and she was from there. And so I thought, okay, why not? Let's go there. And when I was growing up here, I would see, you know, okay, Southern California's got all these palm trees. There's plenty of them here. And I don't know, I felt like there was some kind of a relationship to those. I felt a good connection to the palm trees. And I understood that my, you know, my parents both grew up in um, Southern California, palm trees around, and my grandparents were born in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So there's palm trees there too. I visited Hawaii and I thought, wow, it's really cool. I could see this is where my grandparents were. And then I decided to visit Spain and there was more palm trees there. So that's where I felt a connection and even, what's even stranger than that, my daughter and I, um, back in 2019, she graduated from high school. And I thought, you know what, let's go to Spain just for fun as a high school graduation gift. And we took off. And I felt like it was just, it was a major trip, I'm telling you, because we took the bus and we traveled from France all the way down to southern Spain. And we got there and we were waiting, you know, to get into a taxi. And that guy looked exactly like my Uncle Toby. And with this hairy chest and his big bushy eyebrows and his hair and his, his facial expressions. And I, I kind of was like, hey, what's your name? And they, you know, speak Spanish there. And I was like, okay, wait, that's not my uncle after all. But definitely where I'm, I feel like I have a connection where I'm from. And just getting out there and, and getting around, it felt like home to me, like a, a moment of that, the food, the drink, you know, and often the food, you know, would I, I could identify it as stuff my grandmother used to make. And going over to the fl uh, fl flamenco dancers and everything like that, I, I felt it in the moment. And now it's at my responsibility now to pass that on to my daughter. And I'm like, now you know where you're from. And I don't want to have to explain it. Okay, this is who my grandparents were or anything like that. All I have to do is put her in there in Malagra. And her, that's your identity. Look around, take a look, look at the flamenco dancers. <laughs> You know what? It just occurred to me because I know you and your crazy mustache experience and everyone says Salvador Dali. I now see who is Spanish, right? And uh, yeah, I think maybe you could be a descendant of Dali. <laughs> maybe. Perhaps, or maybe even Pablo. Oh, Pablo. Pablo, which Pablo is that? Pablo Picasso? Yes, oh. that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Pablo. <laughs> uh, but you know what? You and uh, you had quite the mustache journey because you, you, I mean, I can see it now, but like your handlebar mustache, I love that because that's so identifying to you. When did you start doing that? 
Oh gosh, I started actually with growing it would have been, well, I shaved it off twice. So since after, hmm, maybe about 10 years ago or so, and then I decided to shave it all off just for fun, shaved it off. And then immediately uh, I got hired to get into a film without the mustache. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I did that. Once that was done, I grew it back again and I haven't shaved it since 2013. But I remember sometimes seeing you and it was very Dolly-esque where you had twirled it to crazy lengths. Oh, okay. I can't see, couldn't see it over Zoom, but it still is. I love that. I love that. Well, I didn't wax it with it today. <laughs> you know, if I had the wax, it would be like, I could get it all the way up here across the T's of my eyes. I love that. But I always joke around with my kids, you know, I said, you know, you know, you'll, you know how you're going to know when I'm mad, when I have this up and over my ears, and then it's <laughs> like, I'm ready for a serious business discussion with you. That's very true. Yeah, but you don't see it up over my ears yet. That means that we're still cool. <laughs> That's good. That's good. It's like, uh, you know, when, when a dog's, you know, fur raises and their hackles get raised, the same thing. It's like warning sign. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Once it goes up over here, you better watch out. So now I did not know this about you, but we were talking that uh, about your film school experience that you went to uh, UCSD and got a certificate program for film editing and sound, which is incredible. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, definitely. So before I got into that program at that school, I'd already was doing things with YouTube. This is 2005. And a friend of mine was very supportive and encouraging to me, you know, hey, you should become professional with this. And so I thought about it and I thought, you know, I'm doing a lot with YouTube. And so I decided, why not? I'll go back to school and get this um, certificate program back in 2008. And there was only 24 students in the program and it was very focused, very fast paced. Uh, focusing on, you know, advertising, um, trailers, commercials, that kind of a thing. Um, very narrowed focus with that. And I jumped in and I had about four semesters with that all together. It was 11 weeks each semester. And so it was a year's worth all in, all, at, all pressed together. And you mentioned about the sound part and I have a fun, something funny to tell you about that. So we get to the third semester and the teacher comes up to me and says, I can, I can excuse you or waive you, you know, you don't have to take this part of the class. And I said, oh, no, 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 I want to take the class. You know, I've already prepared myself to take an F. I'm willing to do that. I'm just curious about it. And so I got in and I went along with it and I realized that you know, this is really a hearing culture, the sound part. And the, the, the teacher said, what do you mean hearing culture? And so I had to switch it around, explain a little bit about deaf culture. We tend to do this, pound here, wave here, that kind of a thing, very visual. But in the deaf culture, there's specific sounds that really affect, you know, the negative side of thing, you know, and in the back of a hearing person's mind, they know that that sound equates to fear or some kind of drama is about to happen. They have specific sounds that they can relate to that. And you have specific sounds that can, you know, relate to the happy parts like laughter. And you hear it just a second before you see it on the film. And it already sets the mood for the hearing audience. And I said, see, that's hearing culture right there. But just the entire thing that whole, I was looking at all the codes and I could see the codes, something like G and F and D. Uh, which are specific sounds. And so I was focusing on that and picking those out. And I just put those together and overlapped them. And, and I could watch the graph, you know, go up and down to, with the sound to match the film and see the body movement to this. And then I would add that sound and make the graph match the facial expressions and line them up 
between the sound and the film and everything was visual to me and then I turned it into the teacher and they said are you sure you're not lying are you actually deaf this sounds really good and I was like I'm just doing the notes the codes there you know and I moved along from that and then other students didn't do as good of a job with the sound and the visual matching and they said, you know, you need to ask John, see if he can teach you how to do this. And they were like, wait a minute, time out. <laughs> you know, I'm the de damn deaf one here. You know, <laughs> And guess what? I got a B in that class. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm doing, but <laughs> I, I, you know, I just was like the hamster in the hamster wheel and doing the work and I got the bee is like, okay, thank you very much. You know, that is so interesting. It's, it's funny that I've, I've had this discussion with deaf actors before and they said that a lot of movies that hearing people find really scary, they're like, it wasn't that scary because they didn't hear that scary music and they're just on the visuals. And that's when you realize how much of horror films are relying on that tension and the music where deaf people watch it and be like, I didn't get why it was so terrifying. Sometimes if it's just a creepy theme, I think that's more universal, but you are only the third deaf filmmaker I've met who has figured out sound and knowing how to match the sound waves in the editing program that is so interesting to show that there is some mathematics involved and it is visual when you are doing some things. There was one deaf filmmaker who decided that he was completely deaf, zero hearing, and he decided that he was going to go through the sound library and just choose the sounds with the interesting name. So for example, a door was open and instead of looking for door creaks, he may have a cat meow. So he would hit the timing correct because he could see the, the waves and just things that vibrationally felt right or the names. And he was a pretty abstract filmmaker as well. But I remember thinking, what a fascinating way to play with sound that he, the timing was spot on. Because like you said, you could mark the visual soundtrack is different than the, uh, the, the audio soundtrack. And he would line things up to match perfectly. And he came up with the craziest concoction that was fascinating. I love that. I love when you take a medium and you do something that's so unexpected because you do have a unique experience. So I say more of that. Yes, and also my dad got, you know, got into film editing too. He was doing that as well. And so we had a lot of discussions about sound and I had a few short films that I had made and I would describe to my dad and I would tell him, I trust you as the sound artist because you're the one that's seen my work all this all this time. And I would explain to him and I would, for example, I would be like, here's the timeline and this is gonna be A1 uh, at one minute or 20 and 28 seconds. And I want the, something to start like that. And then it needs to switch the mood at this point. And I would explain everything to him. And then I would be like, okay, it's, now it's on you, dad, to get that transition without it being odd. I want a smooth transition there at those time markers. And because visually, you could see the transition. So I want the sound to transition at the same time it visually transitions. And then I realized the visually visual editing has its own art and sound editing has its own art approach. So it's nice and powerful to have a combination when they share that together. And so now I'm really shocked because my son is getting into um, electronic music and he's getting kind of dark making his own music there. And so I'm thinking, okay, I guess that um, <laughs> I'm in that, that sound visual medium of art and uh, that's a savage thing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I think that is good. And I love that you combine so much of your multimedia. Now, where do you get your inspirations from? Is it just playing around or do you think about things or is that a happy accident? Where does a lot of your creativity and different formats come from?
Hmm. I have two different types of inspiration. When I see some people and I feel like they think they're right about, you know, sign language or, you know, they're about being strict about the language. Then I try to, you know, get creative with the, the other side of that without being too strict on the rules and where it allows me to play with it. And so that's one type of inspiration. And then the other is where I might see something that uh, causes us to kind of, you know, mm -hmm feel that that burning inside of us and uh, um, something maybe like politics or something right. um, where I don't want to just complain about it. So I take that complaint and turn it into art. You know, I throw that frustration and everything into that and allow it to speak for itself. You know, bring the art there and then the discussions on the art instead of me saying, you know, I, this is what I think or what I want. So I find a creative outlet to help it be more an interesting process. Do you have an example of something like that? Yes, um, I'm not sure though if we could show. Uh, how Maybe you could just that. describe it, just describe it. Sure, sure. So a good example is, um, you know, a COVID artwork that's done and it's got two hands that are holding each other like this. And one's pulling up and one's pulling down and the one pulling up is those people that are like, nah, I don't believe it, you know, anti-vax, I don't need masks, you know, and they have that type of attitude towards it. And the, the one pulling down is like, you know what, it's okay, just go with it, you know, wear your mask and, and you know, and it's, there's some wood there pieces, and we don't see it, but you could feel it in the texture of it. So it's like COVID's there, but we don't necessarily see it from afar, but once you get close, you can see it. The shapes are, and that of it is one of the examples, and the controversy, the argument on both sides, and the interpretations, both sides' interpretation of COVID. And so I have 10 different pieces of art that are actually COVID related, and another art piece that I've um, deciding what it means as far as the opposite between hate and love. And uh, I thought maybe I can do something about that. And so I just cut some pieces of wood and I cut out the word hate. It took me probably about 15 minutes. And then I decided to paint those over and over and over and making an overlapping those. And so you can't actually see the word hate. You can only see three hearts with all the overlapped paint. And it took me two days to paint over that word. And I realized how long you, how, you know, how long you have to work at hate to get to the point of love. And it took a lot of time and a lot of work to get to that point of love where making the word hate was really easy. Like, I hate you. But then to do the work and to prove, you know, my case with COVID. Now I'm curious for people that are looking at both these pieces, like for example, the one with the two arms, if you hadn't had explained it's for the anti-vaxxers versus the people trying to uh, encourage people to, uh, to wear masks and vax, would have people have it? Is there anything else in the art where they can see COVID or any hand shapes or anything, or is it just two arms pulling and people can make their own ideas about what that tension is about? Yeah, I have a few close friends who had come over to see it and their complete interpretation was different than my description. So, and I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled about that. I don't want my artwork to be locked in and to be any uh, expectation on what it means. I just start from my feeling, my emotions, my frustrations and stress, and I throw that into the artwork. And maybe in 10 years from now, it may mean something completely different. But that proves that things do change over the same amount of artwork that things, opinions of it can change. 
Very true. Now, I know sometimes like famous artwork, you're kind of lost until you see the title. Now, did you have a title for that piece of work? Yes. Pull, P-U-L-L. -L. That's it. That's the title. <laughs> because when people see that, they're kind of like pull, like, are we going down? Or are you pulling up? Which way are we going? That's up to you. So the meaning comes from you. And for the other one with hate. Now, I know you said it took a lot to cover that over. And I love that description so much. That is so philosophical as well. And I'm curious for the final piece, could you see hate or I would have no idea it was under there unless you told me. When you see that piece of work and you're looking at it, you're not going to see it. But if there's a light that shines on it just right at an angle, you're going to see the shapes, outlines of those words. And the, But looking straight on, you don't see it. Wow. And is, is that, does that one have a title? Yes, it does. That one is called... You know, uh, like the equal side and then the greater than and then love overcomes hate. Uh, see, now I love that. I want to see that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have um, some of those posted this summer here pretty soon because I'm a little bit shy with all 10 COVID art pieces. So I'm a little bit hesitant. So I want to recover and let COVID recover first a little bit. And then I want to put my artwork out there. And, you know, that's going to be available. People can buy it. But I'm going to make a decision if I'm going to make prints of those as well with my signature on them um, in a limited amount, um, but I want things to recover a little bit more, and then I can be excited about advertising that and putting it out there, and it becomes more of a memory of what we've been through, and uh, this, just this horrible, horrible time. I totally agree. I think that art does heal, that it causes discussion, but I would love to see a poetic piece about the meaning behind the hate, because the way you described it, was so powerful that it was so simple to make the words hate that was easy, but how long it takes to cover it up and to transform it. So I think that is such a deep thought. And like, I'd love to see like an Instagram moving art piece of that description as a poem because it's just putting that out there. That's just because you gave me goosebumps when you said that, so. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great inspiration. I'm going to put that in the back of my head and play along, play with that a little bit. Thank you for that. Of course. Uh, and I'm loving these Malaga pictures in the background. David, thanks for flashing through all these. How's it up in your airplane? It's, it's nice up here. You'd think it'd be chilly, but it's very comfortable. <laughs> the view. <laughs> uh, Okay, so the other thing we were talking about. Enjoying a sangria up there? <laughs> yes. A coffee. <laughs> he has to fly the plane. He'd be crashing into that tower if he had a sangria. <laughs> he has to... Ole. <laughs> <laughs> he has to wait until he can land and we can all have a sangria together. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yes. 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 So now I love the fact that you also work as a deaf interpreter, which is, I, I absolutely love DIs, deaf interpreters. So for our hearing viewers who don't know what this is, you should know what this is because it's incredible and so very important as well. So um, this is for our hearing viewers. John, can you quickly explain what it is a DI does? Yeah. So my plan, you know, as far as rolling up my sleeves and becoming a DI was for surf, not for surf lessons that all happened on 
accident. It was more of a, I felt responsible because there was a surfing school that offered certification for lifeguards and everything. And I don't have a lifeguard certification. So I thought, okay, but I encouraged uh, young deaf surfers to get involved and to learn. And I, I, I said, I'm joining there to, as well to cheer you on. And so we had an interpreter that showed up and the teacher was talking and talking and then the deaf students weren't getting any of it. And I realized immediately and jumped in and I said, do you mind if I kind of take on the role of as a deaf interpreter? And so I got up there and was giving that information to the kids and they were understanding it because it's, it's our natural language. So I was able to explain to them the technology between laying and on a board, paddling out with your shoulders up and your neck to turn. You have to work on strengthening your neck and, and making sure your shoulders are in a right, the right position. But they're like, how are my shoulders and neck right? So I have to show them physically, like if you do this and you put your neck this way, because when you're paddling, it's easier for you to turn your, your neck and see what's going on. If you're too low to the board and you're trying to tilt your head up like this, you're gonna hurt your neck. So you need to bring your shoulders back. And so something like that, when the instructor was saying it, they looked at me and saw how I was describing it and said, I want to use these signs, even with my hearing surf students. And I was like, okay, but where's my copyright on that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's one important place where I wanted to make sure these deaf young surfers understood and could increase their, their enthusiasm for learning surfing and I like seeing that inspiration I'm like you're from Southern California this is your culture here just like people that come here just to visit this they want to you know check this off their bucket list that they've had a, a taco and and went out surfing right <laughs> this is where you're I, from I think that is incredible that you became like yeah, like a co-instructor that, like you said, it's it's your native language and being able to give the information to the deaf surfers. Uh, I think during COVID is when hearing people had the best introduction to deaf interpreters. We had David Cohen, C-O-W-A-N, who is a deaf interpreter, um, Nick Zapko, and I see Z A P. KO, who was actually my roommate at NTD. We, we were roomies together on tour. And the fact that getting these news briefs from them and other deaf interpreters across the country, uh, the information would go through a hearing interpreter that it's oftentimes um, interpreters second languages, unless they're a coda but then through the deaf interpreter to watch the hearing interpreter and to be able to give it fluently so it's as smooth as possible and linguistically possible. I also see deaf interpreters in the courtroom, sometimes deaf people from other countries or of limited language where the the hearing interpreter gives it from English to American Sign Language and then the deaf interpreter will take it and adjust it using whatever method of communication to be able to match with their clients or someone in the hospital who may be not be able to, um, to, to communicate as coherently. And that's when a lot of times interpreters call in deaf interpreters. But the field I think is so misunderstood um, with the importance of it and when it's incredibly useful and important. So I'm a huge advocate for deaf interpreters. Right, and I think it's really important too to clarify that um, to, to be official, they have certified deaf interpreters which would be different than a deaf interpreter. So a CDI versus a DI. A DI is more, um, you know, has the experience and the understanding is more as a basic level of interpretation based on their own experience that I had. But a CDI, they, you know, whether they've experienced that situation or not, it's important that they, they have the knowledge and foundation of interpreting process and the accuracy and the speed and how to do that information transfer to 
meet the, the natural needs of the deaf community. And I think it's important to clarify the difference and recognize the difference between a CDI and a DI. Thank you for that. Yeah, I want to emphasize I'm just a, I'm a DI. I just jumped in with my own experience in that situation. If I didn't have the experience, I wouldn't have been as willing to be the, D, the deaf interpreter in that situation. Do you have any advice for if there's any people in the deaf community who are watching and maybe want to be a DI or a CDI? What advice would you give to any of our deaf viewers watching? Yeah, uh, you know, make sure it's something you enjoy, you know, it's a, it, 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 like puzzles. It's kind of like that. You're always having to figure it out. You like, you're the kind of person that likes figuring things out. And maybe you understand the concept of a CDR or a deaf interpreter, or a, but it's going to be like complex. It might be detective work. You got to get to that. If you like that kind of a thing, you would be perfect for this type of role. And I encourage you to kind of see if you have the experience, get the experience out there and see if you can quickly trans, you know, interpret from one thing to another. Um, and then ask a lot of questions, you know, see if uh, go online and look up CDIs and get in touch with them. See if there's workshops out there available. I'm sure they have ongoing um, school programs that you can go to to become a CDI. I like that. I know that that conversation does come up a lot in the deaf community and especially for hearing interpreters, how to partner with deaf interpreters, because it is a skill, right? Right, right. And also, you know, I've, what I, from what I've seen, I've seen CDIs, the certified deaf interpreters and the hearing interpreters have to have good teaming skills, you know, just like, um, you know, like a tango dance, they're working back and forth and they have to have a good rapport and relationship, then the translations are going to be a lot smoother and it's going to look like the deaf interpreter is actually hearing everything going on, but they don't. It's so true. I have been watching like these CDIs and the deaf or the news briefing, and I can't quite understand how their brain is processing so fast where they're, they're just on, like you said, it's, it, it appears that they are hearing because the message is interpreted so faithfully and beautifully. I don't quite understand how technically their brain works so fast to be able to do that, but uh, it's, I, re I really admire the skill set and the people who do that because it's such an important service. Oh, I agree. I agree. It's, it's, they have to have integrity with themselves and be honest with themselves and have respect for what the process is for the deaf community. And, you know, if they have the interest, then why not? You know, it makes us feel normal to see that, you know, without us having to, you know, make the translations and seeing a, a hearing interpreter and we're having to do that. So they eliminate that part. We have the CDI up there now who's doing that completely so that I can just sit there and watch it and understand it just as fast as they're putting it out. Oh, native speakers, native signers are always going to have better linguistic choices than someone who learns it as a second language. So. Right. Same with sound editing, right? So if you go and you've got your deaf eyes and you're doing the deaf eye editing for the CDI, it kind of can compare with that, just a different approach. You're exactly right. Exactly right. And I value my deaf teams on all my projects so much because they bring things to the table of skills that I don't have. And so I value them so much and rely on them. And I absolutely love my collaborations. And it's something that's really important to my work as a filmmaker who works in this space a lot and with a lot of deaf actors that I always make sure that my team always has deaf people behind the scenes and partnering with me because it's important. Uh, I know what I wanted to talk. Oh, and the other thing you mentioned that you did, which I didn't realize, is that you did some promos and videos for Deaf Hope. 
it's an organization in California that works with victims of domestic violence. Right. So can you tell folks a little bit about Deaf Hope? Because it's such an important organization. Yeah, sure. So Julie Reams. Julie Reams Samario, I believe. Yeah. And um, she saw how I was doing my movies and my film editing and everything like that in previous businesses before. And she wanted something similar that focused on being deaf friendly and something that was could get out on the internet right away on Facebook. At that time, there was not so much Instagram, uh, but on Facebook and get that out there, signed video giving exposure for all the survivors so they don't have to feel stuck in their vic being as being victims and getting that information out there so that they can find a safe way to escape if they needed to and I said sure I'm willing to come down and do that and at first I in the beginning of the process I had to say you know I to be honest with you this is kind of hard for me to completely understand this where it's they're coming from I feel like I'll be asking same questions over again like what does this mean and everything like that and so they said okay hold on I was very honored and humbled to be able to go to a domestic violence workshop for 40 hours and I felt like uh, it was boot camp to me, boot camp on my emotions, on my mind, uh, what these survivors and uh, their journeys have been and understanding what it means to be a survivor, where they felt stuck or where they were victims that where they felt like they had no choice where, you know, in talking with them in those discussions, I realized I didn't have to ask so many questions, I needed to switch that to more of, you know, suggestions and angles and close-ups and and just a cohesiveness with the timing and checking in with them those who are you know survivors and letting them see if this is act authentic to them does this match their experience in these videos and oh that was so, so powerful and uh, I gained experience knowledge with that and I'm seeing more and more within the community, we can have these discussions without as without judgment, you know, about, oh, you're a survivor. And we're changing the, the perspective on that and reframing it. And we're seeing what the community can do and how we can take responsibility to improve our deaf community. Well, I so appreciate you doing that work. The work that Deaf Hope does is incredible, and they were lucky to have you to help get the word out for anybody who might be in that situation. So please go check out Deaf Hope in California for some resources online, because it is a vital organization. All right. Uh, we are at an hour, and Shirley has been a trooper going through uh, for an hour solid, which is way too long. So we are gonna head back to the talk show set to wrap up our show. So let's give a round of applause for John. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your time, your art, your talents. It has been so great hanging out with you. I can't wait to do it again in real life. and. Thank you, Shirley, for uh, for yes. absolutely being a trooper and interpreting for us. You are magnificent and phenomenal. So we appreciate you. And always, David, my co-host, my Ed McMahon, my solid supporter there with Obama legs. Thank this you. This was fun <laughs> as always. <laughs> so thank you all. Please subscribe and we will see you soon. So thank you all. Bye.